we are back eating some food, getting out our forks. It is Coffee House Blunders. Oh my good, Danny. We're here to break down fork, forks. How many forks? Forking, fork. I have a tree in the backyard that's forked, but I don't think that's what they're talking about, Danny. It, well, you know, you mentioned forks for eating. There's forks in the road, and then there's the fork that not many people knew about until the Queen's Gambit, which is a double attack of two pieces on the board with one piece. That is a fork in chess, and uh, it's the name of episode five. What's that one move where like the pawn does like a little dance and it like rounds the corner and then you're like, that's not a real move, but it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. En passant. En passant. En passant. Mm. Yeah. It's funny. I, I There were no episodes named en passant, which is, at least I don't think so. I don't remember epi- what episodes six and seven are. We're going to get there. But uh, yeah, en passant is French for in passing. And I think I've shared, I shared in our previous Blunders podcast that we have gotten some of the most hilarious the most hilarious support messages of all time, like people just like screaming, people saying like his pawn moved like a ninja. And if you're going to allow that kind of illegal stuff, I'm not going to play on your site. Just crazy stuff. But Google Google yourself some en passant listeners if you don't know what the rule is so that you don't make that mistake of thinking that the pawn made a magic move. I'll put a, I'll definitely put a link to our previous podcast where we did talk about this heavily and also to the chess.com article. And that's right. If you're brand new to the podcast, well, welcome. You should totally go back to the very first episode of season two, because we are breaking down the Queen's Gambit episode by episode with no spoilers going forward because I haven't watched them going forward. So Danny is doing a great job of not spoiling anything. And if you're brand new, well, you're in for a treat because I'm James Montemagno. I work for a software company called Microsoft. And by day, I am a manager of people doing awesome things. And by night, I'm a chess aficionado, trying to be at least, and at the same time, Batman. Batman. I mean, yeah. I'm going to write that joke until it's way overplayed. So, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. And my my best friend in the entire world right here, Danny Daniel Wrench, um, who is a international master and the chief chess officer or chief content officer at chess.com. This podcast sponsored by chess.com. It's a website where you can play chess. Hey, you just, you just nailed it. I love when you do your thing <laughs> to intro the episode. <laughs> All right. No, but this is, I'm excited about this one. I mean, I know I not, not just because of the hangover that was episode four, right? It was, mm. it gave us a lot to write home about and to be sad about. And again, no spoilers in about future episodes. That's what James just promised you. But remember, we are allowed to talk about every episode up till now. So episode four really left us with a heavy heart. And I feel like episode five, you know, kind of brings the rebound back into some chess. We get some old characters coming back. We get some interesting stuff. Yeah, no, I I, I, I agree with you. I really enjoyed this episode. I have a lot less notes because I, I think I just spent less time focusing on the chess and focusing in on the story a little bit because we do get um, quite a few years, five years since um, kind of like the opening here. And we're sort of coming up to the end of the years that are about to pass in this in in this franchise for season one. But I think that the opening is really iconic here where her mom, I'm pretty sure it's her mom. I'm going to say it's her mom is sitting there talking to her kind of like laying down on a bed, not Mrs. Wheatley, but her, her mom, mom, best mom. Yeah. And she says, mom, you know, birth mother, birth mother. She goes, you know, she says other people, um, you know, you, you need not worry about you need to worry about yourself. She said, someday you will be all alone and you'll need to take care of yourself. And that is very iconic for her mom to have said that to her growing up. And then Beth is literally there right now. Right. You know, it, and like you said, it's, it's, uh, it's iconic. It's, it's, uh, it's prophetic. Unfortunately, it's also, it's also kind of sad, right? Just cause like the message and the message that your mother is delivering to you as a child is, Hey, you can't, it's, it's kind of like all the tones to go with it. You can't trust anybody. You can't count on anybody. You're going to be all alone. You're going to have to do it, you know, and, in all the ways that matter by yourself. And, you know, as, as those who are with us on this podcast journey, we know that now uh, Mrs. Wheatley has moved on. She has, she has died. And so Beth is quite literally all alone and it, and it starts with the scene, right? She's rolling up to her now, the house that she now owns, apparently, according to Mr. Wheatley. Um, and, uh, she's walking into it for the first time as a, uh, as a solo home, home, homesteader, not, not homesteader. That's the wrong term, but she's a solo, solo home alone, but this is not a good, this is not a good Kevin McAllister home alone story, right? This is like a, this is, 
Although, was Home Alone a good story, or was that a sad? I don't remember. Was Home Alone a good thing? How sad would it be if all your family just left you on Christmas and forgot you? Man, I don't know. I'd be, I'd be, I would be pretty sad. I mean, I think as a kid, well, it's, it's different, right? You're like a 19 year old versus like this, like seven or eight year old. <laughs> I mean, obviously, Macaulay Culkin had like a great time, but then it became really scary really yeah. quick. Whereas at least when you're 19, like you know, she has a job, right? right? She she can c- call people on the phone to take care of some stuff, right? And she's got some contacts at least. Like I don't know if I was seven year old in in the Midwest, right? It's snowing. There's old yeah. creepy people. Well, I, right. I wouldn't feel comfortable, Danny. I yeah, don't want. No, I don't like they, that. they definitely romanticize the whole. I, I mean, wow, we are digressing here, but I love it. Home Alone is not a tale of positivity for Kevin McAllister. Let let the record state anyway. So sorry, go ahead. You you drive you drive the ship. I'm just here to be the uh, the chess guy. So where where are we going first as we break down this episode? I think we have to go with that phone call. Mister Harry Beltic yeah. um, gives a little ring ring on the phone. He's uh, he's giving her a call in the rain. I love that he's in a telephone booth. Uh, Beth picks up and I love this. Actually, he gives condolences on the loss um, that she just had uh, to Borgov. To Borgov. Not, actually not, to her, not about the to term. <laughs> no, right. that comes later, um, right. I think. And then, you know, I love the, com- the, the, the back and forth here. And I wanted to ask you about it because, you know, he gives condolences and he asks, you know, you know, what did you start as? And she said, I was black. And he goes, yep. you know, better to lose as black than as white, you know? Um, and I don't know what is sort of the, you know, she had obviously crushed him previously and right. what is Beltic, sort of not Borgov. Yeah. Yes. Beltic here. Is this a normal type of exchange that you think that chess players, because we sort of see exchanges here later on too, of chess players, being like, oh, I'm so sorry about that loss. That must have been terrible, right? Or yeah. like that was the crushing. Is that common practice? So yeah, I, I had notes about this phone call too. The first notes I just want to make real quick because I, I said them in the last episode that for some reason, you know, they they nail so much perfectly about the chess in these in this whole series in every episode. For some reason, both the uh the 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 Spanish speaking announcer and then Harry Beltic, kind of the way they describe the opening is just interesting to me because they make it sound like she played the Ross and Limo and that was a mistake when in act when in actuality Borgov played the Ross and Limo. And again, Beth's description of the game when she's talking to her uh, unbeknownst to her deceased mother in the bed where she says like, Hey, he surprised me with the sideline. Like that's actually a better description again, from the end of episode four, this was just weird how they break that down where like, she was just playing her game, the Sicilian and he played the Ross and Limo and she didn't know what to do, even though, Beltic makes it sound like, well, that was a mistake to play the Ross and Limo. Again, the same conversation took place on the on the payphone. I just had to note that because it's not it's not the exact way the chess brain knows what went down. So, all right, sorry, got to get that off my chest. Um, now about the loss, like, I, so it's really we're gonna get into this whole episode, right? And obviously, the whole episode in so many ways, I think, is not just about Beth's relationship with with Beltic, but also kind of what he represents in terms of how Beth is both kind of sought after by a lot of like the men in the chess world, but also how she relates to a lot of them really not from a relationship standpoint first, but as like competitors and like, and kind of peers first. And we'll get into all that. So like the fact that she instantly starts like taking this guy into this like camaraderie role and just debating the chess, it was just, it kind of sets up the whole tone of the episode. And Mm. I, I wouldn't say it's that normal that you would, that someone would go out of your way to just say, Hey, I saw that loss. Yo, that was a bummer. Um, but you know, I don't know. I mean, this is a this is a world of chess girls, and we are chess girls living in it, right? I mean, it's that's kind of the whole dialogue of the entire show, and all of these relationships between these characters are based around the fact that they met each other and and often competed at chess tournaments. So I think it's the most comfortable way to like start a dialogue with someone. So I, I I made the same note. I was thinking, yeah, maybe it's not that abnormal. I will say they definitely nail it in that. One thing a chess player would say to another is console them with like, hey, like you lost this black. That's all right. It's not a true showing of because it's it's kind of like winning with white at the high levels is kind of like holding serve in tennis, right? Mm. Like they're kind of supposed to. And so um, even if it's not totally true, 
it, it gives you like a little bit of a story you can tell yourself like, hey, I lost with Black. I haven't had the opportunity for the first move yet where I get to set the tone with my opening preparation and the style of the game that I want is white. And so that that part of it is like the, the proper condolences that appear trying to encourage you would say is like, hey, you've lost with Black. That's not that big of a deal. Better do is that way than with white. You'll get them next time. That That was definitely like authentic dialogue. Okay, that's good. Yeah, and we talked about that last podcast actually when we were talking about uh, Mike and Matt talking about the computers and white will always win and all these these things and how you know what the advantage is there as right. well. So it is very fascinating to me. I, I I like this exchange and this exchange really led to a rekindling of a, of a Harry Beltic because the last time we saw a Harry Beltic, uh, Beth was wasn't frazzled she had she beat him i think that she was agitated with him i think that's the word i'm going to use is agitated because he's sort of an agitating guy and um you know he says he's moving back home and you know she basically invites him over because he offers up i love this exchange too he offers up to help her and then he goes i know that you're a better player than me but i still think i can teach you a few things right i thought that was pretty cute because yeah He's correct. Like, I mean, one, she already beat him and right. clearly Beth Harmon is amazing. Right. No. And, and also that she invites that. But but I think that with the way they they foreshadowed the mother, kind of the, you know, the flashback to the mom at the beginning. And now here she is, mm-hmm. you know, th- I think there's it was twofold. Right. One, it was like, you know, helping us understand this character, Beth Harmon, even better in terms of the subconscious kind of, you know, difficulty she has that, you know, her fears of always being alone and fears of maybe becoming her mother. And I think that's partly why she jumps on this, basically invites this guy who she hasn't seen in years, you know, over to her house in the middle of the night, right? Like she would rather, she would rather do that than spend five minutes alone in her deceased kind of mother's house, right? I think that, Mm. so I think that the writing of the episode was really you know, on point in that, like it kind of shows you again, here's even more. We're peeling back this onion, right? Every layer of the onion makes you cry when it comes to Beth Harmon's life. And it kind of reminds you a little more of what's at her core. And then shows she, she doesn't want to be alone. She's going to invite this guy over who she hasn't seen in the middle of the night. And, and I think she almost didn't care whether he had anything to teach her at that point or not, because as we see from the rest of the episode, okay, you know, we'll get into it. Right. But I think, I think there's, I think that that was like, she wanted to spend time with anybody and he was kind of just the right guy who clearly had been waiting for her to come back to Kentucky, given that he called her pretty much the moment she arrived. Yeah. Yeah. And he was ready with his uh, flaming hot car. Yeah. He pulls up in a flaming (laughs) hot car. It was, uh, that barely runs. It was amazing. Like who is this guy with his car? It was great. Um, no, there's, there's quite a lot to be said here. I think the one thing that stood out to me in sort of the entirety of their exchanges is this concept of study versus analyze. Cause you know, I think the exchange between Harry Beltic and her is whatever. I'm not really enthralled by this part of the, the episode, but I think the one thing that is the takeaway from Harry Beltic, at least from what I can see is that he says, you know, some people study and some people analyze and she studies while he analyzes. He says, you know, I don't understand why, or she says, I don't understand why people would play back the games over and over again, which she's done in the past when um, Benny has called her out. Right. But she mostly studies and she reads and she reads and she reads, but she's not analyzing the games in a way. So there's this exchange where I think more than anything, he's bringing this aspect that there's really two sides of chess. There is the studying, but there is the analyzing and you can learn a lot from both. And I think that was probably the most impactful part because he said, listen, you, you need to study, but you also need to analyze your co- opponent. You need to analyze Borgov, right? He gives um, her his book and he says, you know, look at the uh, Leningrad 1962, the Lachenko and the Spassky matches. I think those are real people, right? Those are real people. Uh, Spassky for sure. The first one, I actually, I'm glad you said it again. I need to, I need to look it up. The first one I think was a, was a debatable one, but Spassky for sure. In fact, a lot of people have said that uh, Borgov's character is sort of loosely based on Spassky, um, mm. given given the way they describe his style. And Spassky was the the enemy of Fisher that Fisher ultimately defeated in seventy two. So yeah, a hundred percent. And again, they do a great job. I, I didn't even check into Lachenko because I, once I heard the name Spassky, I'm just kind of capping it too. They do a great job of mixing fact and fiction amidst these, you know, this very accurate timeline and kind of depiction of chess. Yeah. 
Did you find anything in in this? I mean, we didn't get to the kiss yet, but I mean, the whole exchange. I'm looking here. I kind of, I kind of have not very many notes. It was kind of the interaction. Okay, this is gonna sound bad. The interactions and in sort of the first part of of Harry Beltic in this episode were almost as throwaway as Harry Beltic. Like that's about as much right. Harry Beltic that I want in my life, which is not that much. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, okay. So, I mean, we, we can jump ahead to the, to the, but I think, so what's interesting about all these analysis scenes, right? Let's back up. Cause by the way, I, I, I very little to add on what you said. I thought you did a really good job as the, as the non, the non chess pro among the two of us, you did a great job describing kind of what, what Harry built a, like the point is that he's trying to make, right? Like the, the, the guy showed up with like a point he was trying to make right to, to Beth mm-hmm. about chess. And, and you did a great job describing there's, there's this process of like studying things like on an abstract level. And that's what Beth kind of wants to do. And, and sort of one of the things that they consistently go back and forth on in the dialogue is like the references to these great players. Like they, they say J.R. Capablanca, who of course is Ho- Jose Raul Capablanca, who we've seen mentioned in several episodes. Right. And mm-hmm. the reason why he's such a great reference for Beth and and the style that she has is because Beth's known as this sort of intuitive player that relies on just sort of her natural talent. And and we saw, you know, her her mom, Mrs. Wheatley, talk about that in the in the previous episode. We've kind of seen this from the beginning that sometimes she needs to slow down and get concrete and kind of analyze stuff rather than rely on her attacking and sort of intuitive intuition. Um, later on in this episode. We see Benny Watts even reference that she attacks like Alakine, which of course that's the American pronunciation of Al Yohin, just for the record. So, um, so yes, these guys like Al Alakine, who was the world champion, um, right after Capablanca for the record, and Capablanca is like an homage to these guys that were more intuitive in nature, more like super talents, right? Than like the Russian method of like, yo, we're gonna get concrete and analyze the bleep out of this and get so technical we leave no room for error right? Like the stone cold Mm. killer mentality. And so there's this like, there's this sort of struggle in, in, in in Harry Beltic trying to get Beth to embrace this other part of chess that is very technical. Like all the books he's recommending for her to read are like, are like the Rook End Games book, right? And, and analyzing Borgov's games to find weaknesses. And it's a hundred, you nailed it a hundred percent in terms of what they're trying to point out, I, I would say, is both like the chess weakness in Beth and then like the character flaw weakness where she just kind of wants to like be intuitive and not really get super in touch on like a concrete level. And, um, you know, that might explain like the, you know, the the substance abuse issues the character has and all this stuff. Right. She kind of wants to be a little checked out a little bit all the time. Right. And Harry's like, hey, you need to get super concrete. And then. In the beginning, before the end of their relationship, when we get to the kiss and what happens after, Harry's kind of right. Remember the first few times they're going over, he's referencing like Bodvinik, who again is like the, mm-hmm. again, and Smizlov. These are the, like the Soviet chess school fathers. And she kind of tries different ideas and he's like, yeah, try it, right? There's that one scene where she made them sandwiches and and she recommends like this move rookie eight. And he's like, yeah, try the line. And then in the line, Harry gets to kind of up one her, one upper and say, see, that that's why it doesn't work, right? And, and that's kind of his point is trying to get her to be a little deeper and more concrete. In addition to the fact that he just clearly is in love with her and we'll get to that now with the kiss. So, uh, but I just kind of wanted to say that because I think you did a great job. And I think that I wanted to say that in the beginning, I think they, they set it up that Harry is actually right about her. Like Harry's Mm. Harry kind of has a point and he's, and he's uh, the chess is sort of reflecting that he's kind of getting, he's getting little shots in here and there, despite how talented she is. Um, you know, there's the scene where she beats him five times in a row and he's like, yeah, but, but what's your plan? Like, you're just relying on this intuitive stuff to beat me. Like, where's your concrete plan? And anyway, so those were the notes I made about the episode is that I think they wanted to make a really good point about what her weaknesses were. But then as she kind of integrates this and, and then eventually they get to this kiss, she kind of gets done with him as quickly as she embraced him a little bit. It's true. No, I think you make a good point there of all the individuals that he was pointing out. He called out a lot of names. He was trying to set an example, like you were saying about, um, the different moves that, that, he, that could surprise her. I think also he was trying to attempt that there are a lot of different people and a, do- a lot of different play styles. Like he talks about Philander who does like blind chess. Um, he makes, he makes a, he's about to make tons of references to Morphe. And I do want to talk yeah, about Philidor, Morphe a yeah. lot. Yeah. Um, Philidor. Yeah. Philidor. He talks about blind, you know, blind chess, which, you know, kind of 
oddly bites her a little bit later in Bullet, which to me is is similar. It's 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 taking chess in a different way, and you know, it's it's good because every single time in which she is challenged. She doesn't like to admit that challenge, right? But then she learns from it, right? She doesn't. She's not going to admit to um, Benny when he tells her about the move. You know, he's she's going to go off and do it. And he, she's going to, you know, figure it out on her own and then come back and do do the do the thing. So I think it's a good interaction. I um, I'm ready now. I'm ready now. By the way, um, you're, you're ready to talk about the kiss. Yeah, now or never. Uh, that was nice. That was a nice little reference there. Yeah. So what happens is you you say what happens. So they're sitting there talking over the chessboard. He's gonna move to an apartment and come less. So instead she says, Well, why don't you move here? And scene. And scene and Beltic, who obviously has been oogling over her nonchalantly this entire time, leans in for an awkward kiss, like everyone's first awkward kiss. It was adorable. And Beth it's like, like, okay. And then, yeah, she says, you know, she's like, well, no, whatever. I wasn't ready. She's like, it's fine. You know, whatever. And she goes, now I'm ready now or never. And then it goes in and then they, they have some sex. And then my favorite part is he's, he's like, do you want me to stay or do you want me to, to go? Uh, and she's like, she's like, whatever, like, yeah, it's whatever so, you want. It's care. so funny. Yeah. the way, So yeah, about first about the kiss, I think that the, the initial reaction to the kiss kind of tells you how she really feels about him. Like right then. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. obviously, and maybe she didn't even know herself, but you know, it's like, you know, like it's where you, where you quickly move past the honeymoon stage of thinking this might be a good thing to like instantly realizing in a kiss, like, Oh, I don't want to be with this person. Right. I think a lot of people mm. have had that experience or can relate to that. Right. But she, whether it's out of feeling bad for, for Beltic or out of being lonely herself, for whatever reason, she kind of says like, no, I just wasn't ready. Right. Even though I think that at least I think the directors and the writing does such a good job. Again, they're constantly making us kind of read what's being said without it being said. Right. I think, I think, you know, instantly that she's not into him. Right. Yeah. But, 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 you know, but she says now I'm ready. Like you said, they go in, they have some sex and then it's like instantly afterwards, she's immediately like done with him. She lights up a cigarette and opens a chess book like the moment it's done. And, um, and he just kind of doesn't even know what to do with himself laying in bed. And yeah, it's, it's a great scene. It's a really yeah. great scene because it, it's so telling of her, her, the relationship they have his sort of, not that he's meaningless in her eyes, but there's no real connection there. Like it right. was, it was a, it was a usage in a way. Um, and the relationship's kind of a usage, right? And, and right. I think she wants to learn something. He's interested in teaching her. They both have some sexual needs. A Harry maybe more than her, but she's like, right. you know, she's also alone, right? So she wants some some connections there, and um, right. he does too because he's alone too, technically, when you think about right. it. And um, yeah, it, yeah, it's fascinating. Even though we can kind of see the writing on the wall right then, like then they cement it like in the next chess scene. And again, this is if you've. There's no, I, we obviously don't have to say this for our listeners because if you're five episodes deep with us and, uh, you know, you haven't seen the show yet, then I, I, I don't even know what to say. But so we're all say we're all on the same page here, right? That the writing has just done such a good job of like, I think they're developing the characters both on and off the chessboard. And then the moment we go back to the next scene with Harry and, and Beth, they're on the porch and she kind of sacrifices something and, and he's going to kind of lecture her like, no, again, you're, you're playing like, I'll say Capablanca or, or Al Johan or Tao, like that's not how you play. And she's like, no, 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 dude, I've gone way beyond you here. Right. Which is, which is true. And, and now she's kind of lost even her sort of pillow talk or, you know, the way, the way she would deliver it in a way that is softer. She just doesn't even care anymore. Right. And, and that's not necessarily because they've had sex or not, but it's just like the relationship has kind of run its course. And, and so not only does she like, kind of prove him wrong but then sort of in a demeaning fashion is like well i wish you were i wish you could see it right and and that kind of is like the nail in the coffin for for harry both in in the good and the bad i think for what he came there to learn he's kind of like all right now i realize what i am to this person i, I i'm not here to ever have anything in a long-term relationship neither neither both like in a relationship or on the chessboard with beth right oh i agree yeah and you know and when they're sitting there playing chess and she beats him and she, she's talking about the entire, she doesn't beat him yet. She's, she basically talks it out and she's like, why can't you see this? Right. Why it's so right. obvious what's right. about to happen. And he's like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I'm not as fast as you, right. I can't see it. And she's like, I wish you would. 
right? I mean, um, and and that that he gets up and he and he he kind of storms out and and I, I want to I'm going to go back to some scenes that were in between this, but if we stay focused on Harry, because um, what happens here is he decides he's going to leave, he's going to move out, and this is right. where he sort of instills two pieces of knowledge. First, a little bit of where he's at with chess and also where he, where he believes she aligns with other right. similar chess players. So she, he starts to have tons of Morphe talk, by the way, there's tons of Morphe talk all of a sudden and he brings it up at first. And then, you know, when he leaves, he says, listen, you know, I've sort of fallen out of chess a little bit and, you know, but you. He, she does. He, he's like, I don't have what you have, right? He still obviously right. likes chess and things like that, but he doesn't have that drive. So he's going to go back and he figure out what he wants to do in his life, right? But then he leaves and he gives her the Morphe's book, and he says, "You have a lot in common with him." And if people don't know Morphe, you know, he kind of says this guy's like, you know, was lost his mind, right? He used to stay up in Paris, play all night. He used to, you know go, you know, just play these amazing, brilliant games. And he's making a lot of connections, like flashback to episode one, right? Um, In the very beginning. But I want to talk about Morphe because I don't know the life and time of Morphe. And I feel like this is a great part to stop. And for our international chess master, Danny Wrench, to lay down some Morphe knowledge, because we've talked about Morphe, I think a tiny little bit, but why is it so important in this, in this moment in this context well, of Beth's life. I, I think you you hit the nail on the head and then I and you made me realize we both forgot to talk about something a little bit earlier. Remember when Harry first moves in with her and then he goes into the bathroom. Remember what he finds, right? Yes, he, the pills. He, he, he finds the pills. And even though it, I think we take I, I feel like it the reason I realized we forgot is because we've all been doing this now and we realize from Harry Beltic's perspective, remember as a character, he didn't actually know that she was an addict probably until that moment. Right. Oh yeah. And so and so I think that was a big deal because I think while that happens early on in this episode, it, it helps us understand even more. Like it doesn't mean he wasn't still in love with her and they kept doing all this chess stuff. But I think in the back of his mind, as he continues to get to know her and he sees her behavior and he knows he found the drugs, all that stuff is playing into like what is is coming to where you are now, which is now now he's leaving. They, they've had sex. You know, they've had this sort of blow up moment at the board. You know, and she wakes up that morning. He's there with a briefcase instead of having breakfast. He's leaving, and like you said, he gives her this book, and this whole Morphe conversation ensues. So, so here's my you want my so my international master. I'm not a Paul Morphe aficionado in the sense of I'm not I'm not the world's leading expert, but I will say Paul Morphe is sort of iconic and legendary as far as chess talents go. In in the in the 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 mithril like kind of like whatever the the myth lore of the chess uh of of chess is that paul morphy is kind of considered the unofficial first world champion um paul morphy was a french american who lived in new orleans most his life uh and as he became a super talent he from a very wealthy family which makes sense because in the early 1800s into the mid 1800s chess was much more of a game for the for the wealthy elite right it wasn't like people were playing chess um People, people without means didn't play chess, right? Because it was a game for kind of like the high-minded intellectual kind of stuff. And so Morphe was from a very wealthy family, um, kind of always groomed to go into law. Like I believe his father, it was def- or it was either father or uncle. And as he became this super chess talent, he played in Europe. And the most famous Paul Morphe game, like literally if you Google Paul Morphe opera game, there's this very legendary game, um, which has already been referenced in this in this. Um, in this show, I believe the opera game, I can even pull up our amazing, the amazing doc that my team did of all these different games. Where was the first, where was the opera game mentioned? Um, there's the Greco, the scholar's mate. Uh, where is the opera game? Hmm, I'll, have to, I'll have to look for it. Um, I'm pretty sure it was, it was mentioned, but the uh, Paul Morphy was sort of just this legendary character who was cleaning up Europeans. And there was this game versus the Duke of Brunswick at this, at this opera house. Um, and he, he beat the, he beat this tandem pair and, uh, or, or let me look at it. It's the Duke of Isgard. You're probably already looking it up. What is the opera game? Opera. So opera, opera, game bo- yes. opera box game. Oh, versus versus Paul Morey, Paul Morphy versus. Duke Carl. Um, 
trying to find it. The opera game is like literally, literally the most legendary. Why is the opera game important? It's Paul Morphy's sort of like magnum opus. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a game that is, has been sort of commonly referenced as, um, like a perfect chess game. Okay, here it is. So it's against Duke Carl II of Brunswick and the French aristocrat Count Isoart de Vavenargois. Okay, so Paul Morphy's game is against these two sort of wealthy Euro- European aristocrats um, in this opera house. And it's basically like the perfect game of chess. And it's full of sacrifices and like just amazing tactical aggressive play. And it it's kind of like the it's considered by many to be like maybe the most genius chess game of all time. Right. Mm. But Mo- Morphy then eventually after dominating Europe basically disappeared into the streets of new Orleans, which was assumed and common knowledge that he just was a massive drug addict and alcoholic and died at a very young age. Um, we can look up his Wikipedia C, but without going into all that, I think I've done enough to say that Paul Morphy is sort of this mythical kind of iconic legend of the chess world seen to have been the first ever world champion. Um, he was in Amer- a French American, which is a huge deal. And before the Europeans and particularly Eastern Europe and Russia, the Soviet union took over and he um, basically played this legendary game of chess that's considered you know, maybe the most perfect chess game of all time and died at a young age due to obsession and basically drug, drug addiction, right? As as a fanatic chess player, he was a drug addict. And so now back to what Harry Beltic is saying, which he's basically telling Beth Harmon that it's not just that you might become Morphe that, but you kind of are Morphe in terms of, and maybe that was, I I made a note that I thought Harry Beltic's comments were a little harsh and maybe coming from a little bit of a heartbroken man. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest, because she clearly broke his heart. But I'm not saying that they're not that they weren't wrong, right? Or they at least weren't a for, a fair warning to Beth about what not to become, right? But what was your thought on how direct Harry was with with his opinion of, of Beth there? Yeah, it was kind of classic Beltic. I think that he was definitely upset about the situation. He, you know, regardless if he did have feelings, he had some sort of feelings for Beth. You know, they obviously spent a night together, maybe multiple nights together. We don't know. You know, there's some connection there that he had. So, that, but there is also this fear that he doesn't want to to see her go that way. But I don't think that he can express he can't express feelings well. That's one thing that we've noticed with Harry Beltic is, right. and neither is Beth really well. But he, definitely, Harry Beltic does not ex, he doesn't know how to express things. So that's his way of expressing, you know, his which is like, hey, you're you're you got to read these books. You're not doing this right. It's like this example. You're you're turning into this. You know be careful. You know, that's what he, that's how he ends her is be careful. And he gives her the bottle back, which is kind of like you stole her pills, but like, is it even her pills? Right. You don't know if it's her pills. Like it could be your mom's pills. Right. Her mom just died. Jeez, geez Louise. So, um, yeah. Uh, well, I think, he, I think he knew he was, he was right, but it, yeah, but it's definitely like, you're not that like, there are shades of right. Right. Like they're like black and white. What is, what does Yoda say? Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Right. Or maybe that's what mm-hmm. Obi-Wan says. I forget. Right. But I think I think that's true, right? I think that it's it's the luxury of the ignorant to deal in pure dogmatic thinking. And I, I've said that before. I'm sorry if that gets too deep, but that generally tends to be my opinion on philosophies of life. I think people are complicated. I think we're all flawed. And I think, you know, you know, ignorance is bliss in the sense that we get to believe, well, I'm a hundred percent right about this person or that thing. And I think that Harry's a heartbroken dude in this moment kind of angry, kind of come to terms with the fact that he's never going to be as great of a chess player as Beth and that the woman he he loved and kind of had an obsession with, right? Like he thought he loved her. Maybe he realizes, maybe I didn't really love this woman. I love the thought of her, right? And I yeah. think that's kind of what he comes to realize. And I think he's a little angry, so he throws some barbs. That said, I mean, like, he's not wrong. I mean, Beth is, Beth is chess first, chess second, chess third, right? That's what he mm-hmm. learns about who Beth Harmon is. And and she doesn't she doesn't love him or at this point maybe maybe anybody right and more than chess and and he kind of he kind of points that out to her and kind of says like combine that with having a drug addiction hey this may not be the best path for you i think that it, there were probably a lot softer ways to warn a friend about things you're worried about than to say you are already Morphe. And by the way, Morphe died at a young age with a drug addiction, right? Yeah. And, and he, and so. he quit chess at 22 and you're 19 right now. So you're not too far away from where he's going to, you know, you're going right. to go mad basically. Right. Um, 
So well, okay, I have Harry, so many things to say about this, by the way, that yeah. I can't until you know the end of the series. So because okay. you have no idea how it ends, right? No idea. No, not at all. Okay. So I have to hold back, but I, I will say this, and I and I know I know I said that in the last episode of episode four. I promise you I'm not about to give you any spoilers. But what I, I do really like episodes five, six, and seven. I like where the show goes from here. I, I told you when I watched episode four for like the second time with my wife, and she was like, This is why I don't want to see the show, right? And what is it? Where's this going? I do really I was both surprised and encouraged. I, I, I enjoyed the show overall. And and I'll say that this episode is where in a good way, I feel like they start to get really deep and start to get heavy about, you know, what's at stake for this person, not just on the chessboard, but as a person, right? And I think that as yeah. as kind of messed up as this Harry Beltic kind of sign off is and all this stuff, I just like that they get they get kind of real, right? It's like, oh man, bleep just got real, right? And and that's kind of what happens here in this relationship with Beltic. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And 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 if you as we talk about this, there's less chess to analyze because we don't get to really see any chess because they really took this episode to take a break from that and really focus on these things. I think there's a lot of fascinating things that there was two fascinating things that happened during her time at um, with Harry Beltic. One, I want to say, if we jump back now a little bit, is the Borgov interview um, mm-hmm. that is a flashback that has a flashback to him playing you know, in one of the, the multi whatever things as a child, you know, and, and there's this sort of simul, a simul, a simul. I love how you just said a multi, whatever thing. First of all, I freaking love that. I am going to now call every simul I play from henceforth with a multi, whatever thing. (laughs) So good. (laughs) It's a, it's a multi, whatever thing. That's the thing with the you and the thing. And they play the games all at the same time simultaneously. It's it's, it's the, the thing with the play, the multi things. Yep. Um, I think this was a, this was was fascinating because finally she sits down. She she's reading about him. We see this flashback where Borgov says, "You know, now he's playing people half his age, and time is the only thing. Like he doesn't know how long, how much longer right. he's going to be able to do it, and right. time is the real enemy." Right. Yeah. That, that was fascinating. Danny oh, I, oh fascinating. sorry. Cool. I, no, I, Anyways, I, I was listening to you. I loved it. I, I really don't have anything to add. I think it was a great interview, and I think you're right. It sets the tone that. You know, I guess any any great champion feels that way. I think at a certain point, you see people express that, right? I th- I, I really feel like I've heard Federer or I did years ago say a similar thing, right? It doesn't matter what you do, right? Time catches up with everybody, um, yeah. and I think that it's definitely setting the tone for how great of a challenge Borgoff will be in this inevitable battle that we know will come, right? But also, kind of like you know, just the way he the way he approaches things too. He I, I personally feel like the more I get to know Borgov, the more I like him, right? Yeah. Um, and he and he's kind of like humble in the sense that he knows how great he is, but he also knows like, hey, like, it, death comes for us all, as they say. Well, you know, I think you get to see a little bit of Borgov when he's out with his family. Like, there's a human there. And I think that's what we right. get to see where a lot of this um, is set up where they say that the Soviets are, you know, a brick wall, you know, they, they're, right. they're not human almost where, you know, right. the, Borov's a real human, right? They're there. Now I will say this, as we move on, there's an amazing scene, maybe my favorite scene, second to favorite scene in this episode, which is the, oh, how the tides have turned on Margaret from high school, mm-hmm. um, inside of the Ben yeah. Snyder. Mm, yeah. Where, now, where now she Johnson, goes, Margaret Johnson. Now, yeah. <laughs> Margaret Johnson, that's right, where she goes, you know, because back in the day, she was making fun of Beth for shopping there, and she would never shop there, but who's there? Margaret Johnson, that's right, um, with her little baby, and alcohol in the bottom yeah, that's, of it. that's and- the real twist, right? You see the alcohol right at the last second. Sorry, go ahead. I loved it, though. I, I agree. It's It's sort of sad, but it also shows, like, you know, Margaret kind of went the path of her late mother, Miss Wheatley. And then we continue on to the Ohio U.S. Championship 1967, not to be confused with the U.S. Open Championship. Those are two different things, Danny, correct? Yes, yes, 100%. In fact, your clarity of that I made a note of because it is a mistake. And I I kind of let it go in episodes three and four um, when it was sort of mentioned by the mother, like, hey, you're like co-U.S. champion. That's actually not true the u.s open is different than the u.s championship the invitational right um and so in the in the chess world you would say you were co-u.s open champion like you would very uh 
uh, purposefully add the word open in that, right? It's a distinct um, difference. And um, anyway, just for just for clarity. So her and her and Benny had previously met at the U.S. Open Championship, but this is the U.S. Championship where the top players have been invited to come and play. So which one's more prestigious? This one? The, the one we're about to see here in episode five. You, uh, the U.S. Open is a, is a big deal. And a, as you saw, it was... It had Benny there, right? Remember in Vegas, Benny Benny was there. Um, but it's a different type of event. So the difference between a close and an open is in an open, you're playing much weaker players at the earlier rounds. And then as all the strong players win, they eventually battle it out at the top. In order to have a clear champion in those events, sometimes open events tend to be a little longer. Like an open event might be nine or 10 rounds so that we have enough time to kind of make our way through lower seated players and then eventually battle at the top. Whereas the U S championship, if it's like only eight players, it could just be like a seven round round Robin. You play each person with each color. Each person has been invited there. And um, so does that, does that make sense? The difference between a close and an open. That makes sense. So yeah, in this regard, does it really make a lot of sense how they sort of threw them into this Ohio sort of college, you know, I mean, Benny, when they meet up, he, he's like, I can't believe we're here. We're playing with plastic pieces on plastic sets. Yeah. Like, I, if lo- a US, I love that whole scene, by the way. If a U.S. championship is supposed to be more prestigious, is this realistic? Is it just of the time? Yeah. Like, why was well, no, U.S. Open realistic crazy? of the time? It's, it's more prestigious in terms of the strength of it, but it doesn't mean it's more prestigious in terms of the, um, the atmosphere, I guess, right? Because – so I see what you're saying now you're, because you're kind of making a comparison to the environment of the U S open where it had like the glitz and the glamor sort of thing, right. In Vegas yeah. versus this. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, that's funny. Cause that, that I didn't, I didn't think about that comparison, but it actually is a very realistic and accurate comparison in that often the open events, because they ought, because they also get hundreds, if not thousands of more people, there's a lot more there's a lot of money in those events for the organizer. So mm. like the organizer makes a lot of money on all the under sections. In fact, the way a lot of open events work, if you looked up like the World Open, the US Open, the National Open, there's you know the Aeroflot Open, a huge open in in in, in, in Moscow, Russia, uh, that has you know been a staple of elite chess for for decades. Um the way it's funny, this is just how the chess world works. The top sections are borderline philanthropy by the organizer and that they're going to be paying out a lot of money to the to very few big name players um, that they're not going to get back. But the rest of the, the event, all the other sections where your Mike and Matt's come, right? Your Mike and Matt's are paying the entry fee for hundreds and hundreds of players uh, there. And, and so that basically pays for the event, right? And, and very often there's a lot of money for the organizer in an open event where they can afford to sort of liven up the place a little bit, right? Like the events in Vegas are often like a festival. They're, they're a spectacle. Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot in the show of the top player section, which is the more I talk about it, it's really funny. I feel like I'm giving like an existential audit of my own like chess world upbringing. These are oddities I didn't always appreciate right or notice and Mm -hmm. and the truth is man it makes me want to talk to other chess players after this and be like hey have you ever really appreciated how much basically the top section is just a massive loss every year for the organizer and if not for all the other sections where these people come kind of to see the top players they come to see the top players and they pay an entry fee for a section where in their section, the chances of winning a prize are very, very small because they're just not that good, but they're basically supporting the lifestyles of the professionals. And this ecosystem is really what would describe chess opens globally. Holy crap. I just like, I can't even believe what just came out of my mouth, but it's true. And, <laughs> and it's very true. And then the invitationals were like, I can tell you some of the most elite invitationals I played in, which were not, you know, like the most elite like we're kind of had that feel you're kind of like stuck in like the elementary, like school primary room on the weekend, right. Where janitor Bob forgot to do his job on Friday. Right. Oh, Bob. Oh, Bob. Right. Anyway, it's just, it's odd, but it's true. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and it's fascinating because I did look up this originally and I was trying to see like where really the U S championship took place in 1967. It was actually kind of hard to find. I couldn't find it because I got hung up on the U S open championship Mm -hmm. in 1967, which happened in Atlanta and pal Benko won that one. But if you messed up and Google that you would miss that 
1967 is when Fisher won the U S championship and it was his eighth and his final American title. And 1967, he didn't play after that. You're right. Because he was playing other lead events, but 1967 and guess who wins this one at the end of this episode, right? Our, our lovely Beth Harmon, right? Again, the homage to Fisher and, and their, the characteristics of these, of the, you know, whatever, what they're doing with the writing and, and drawing the parallel uh, lines between them happens again in this episode. And let's just give a big shout out to our 2020 championship uh, winner, Wesley So, and our 2019, our our favorite of all time, Nakamura. I just had to look up the last two years for funsies. <laughs> <I love that>. um, <laughs> yeah, Hikaru won his fifth in 2019. Wesley, I think this was his second. Yeah, um, at least second. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and Wesley won it online this year because of COVID. Um, so Hikaru has actually won the last one that took place OTB over the board in St. Louis fascinating yeah i wonder how well 2021 we'll see if we're gonna have a repeat or not and see what happens oh my goodness yep. um well let's get into this scene because this is my favorite sequence of chess ever uh we get introduced to benny and what a great interaction a, pro- uh, a proper introduction we've now we've dealt with him a few times but this is like the most dialogue we've had right he's a real human i think yep. that's what we kind of learned this episode he's a real human and yeah he he, he he's like you know um cheap plastic board, please cheap pieces. Can't believe there's no reporters, anything. And it is a very stark contrast to the U S open that we saw where they two, those were together. That's why I thought it was so, it was unlike anything we've ever seen. This is the first time since the Kentucky, Kentucky state championship in which it's not prestigious. Like the people are falling asleep, snoring in here. And it's, uh, it's odd. Yeah. It's, it's also very, like I said, I loved it because Benny, Benny, like in Benny's character and they, they did a good job with him. I, I, I've said critically in earlier podcasts that in some ways they kind of went over the top with the hat and the, and not the cape. I call it a cape, right? His hat and his cape, his cloak and his belt and his knife, right? Like they kind of went over the top to really drive home the point that Benny is meant to like, just sort of exemplify the, the sort of the idiosyncrasies that a genius chess player has and like a guy that's committed his life to the game, but also everything he says, like he, he appropriately articulates how a lot of top chess players feel like, honestly, like I, and as much as it, I hope it doesn't sound arrogant at all because it's not, it's more meant to like, Hey, where are our cheerleaders? Right? Like I joked when I was younger that I would go and I painted my chess for my brother who played started varsity in basketball. And I was just like, I was my brother's biggest fan. Right. And he eventually played division one in college. And, and he and I always joke because he was so supportive of me. He's like, dude, you're like literally more world elite than I am at chess and basketball. And like, nobody knows it and nobody cheers for you. Right. And it was awesome. It was like a cool thing we shared. And it always like, or my heart that he felt that for me because he was like a huge fan of my chess, right? And I was a huge fan of his basketball. But chess players don't have fans. And like Benny articulates like, hey, like we're the best at the world at what we bleep and do. And we've got this guy picking his, you know, belly button crust, falling asleep at our thing, right? And the other tournaments only have big money, the opens, because it's where the organizers make money, kind of like taking advantage of the amateur sections. And this is literally the ecosystem of the chess world. And for years, James, I mean, if you actually look it up, like until until Rex Singfield came along in St. Louis, for those who don't know of the St. Louis Chess Club and Scholastic Center, I mean, he kind of saved the U.S. championship. Like there was a group out of Seattle for years that Yasser Sirwan brought on that was doing a great job. But then they then they left and there was years where the U.S. championship was not quite as close to what, you know, to what what is depicted here, but not that far from it. Right. And and it really felt odd to the world's best chess players because you just it just I don't know it just didn't it doesn't feel good right to be really good at something and not be appreciated for it and Benny right or wrong he just expresses that he articulates how a lot of chess players feel yeah you know, you're right and, and there's a quite a lot of professions that are out there where it's the same which you right. have this you're you have this fan base in and around chess right and and you see him he was on the cover of chess review magazine in this episode we kind of skipped over that part which was a great scene too um but you know is that prestigious enough? He's not feeling like the celebrity that he, you know, really thinks and believes that they are right. And, and right. I think this U S 
championship is 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 a sticking point there compared to what the other ones were. He wants them all to be that prestigious because they're at the top of the game. So, um, all right, well, we get into the chess because the chess happens in one of the most amazing, like Brady Bunch music based. Yeah. yeah. So good. The so style good. that they do it in, like showing the faces, the squares on the board, right? And uh, and then they just start bouncing around, but it's really just the Beth and Benny show, just beating people. Oh, yeah, crushing it, crushing it, crushing it. You go day one, day two, day three. I, when I watched it again for the second time, I just, I I put it, I was just like, that's just a great scene. I rewound, rewound it again. I was like, I just, I just could watch this all day. It's, it's like very, I don't know. I just, that's kind of how, you know, chess is moving. It's going, it's crushing it. And Benny and, and her just crushing it back and forth. And it, it was fantastic. And then, you know, they get to the end of day three and it's, and it's Benny V Harmon coming up. They have a whole day off. Yep. And, you know, Benny's like, hey, I'm going to go up to the quad, hang out with the bros, drink some Yo, beers, play some chess. We're running through the quad in the gymnasium. You can yeah. bring your green hat. Um, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> it's going to be great. You want to come? And then, uh, of course, she's like, no, I'm going to go study. And But then there's this amazing scene, which is about to come up, which brings us to one of the most popular things in uh, chess right now, which is is Bullet, right? Bullet right. Blitz. Blitz, blitz. We just had the, the Bullet Chess Blitz. Champ championship. Yeah. The yeah, exactly. Speed chess yeah. championships. The S P D W W C US Open. Yeah, there you thing. go. The, Multi uh, thing. the S the S C C W S Eastern Northern Southern Niner um yeah. championship. Um boom. No, but uh yeah, so it's funny, right? So he invites her to come and play on the rest day, which is very common. You would have a rest day at the halfway point, so that checks out. Um, and because my math, I was paying attention to this. I think there were eight players, which would mean the rest day is somewhere around day three or four. So again, math checks out. That would be kind of how it was. Um, and then everybody hanging out with the, uh, with the college kids, having some beers, playing some, playing some speech. Yes. The one kind of dialogue mistake, which my buddy, Sam Copeland pointed out, he had a great video, which pointed out kind of summarized the very few chess mistakes in the whole series. The, the one kind of like weird dialogue thing they have Benny say is like, Hey, you want to play some speed chess or if not, we can play some Skittles or we can play some bug house or some blitz. Mm. Like basically all of those are the same thing. (laughs) And so it's not, that's not other than bug house, which is a specific game in chess where you play kind of two V two boards. We're not going to get into that. That's a, that's a different podcast. Um, But let's say other than bug house speed chess and then playing Skittles is just a fancy term for mess around chess. Mm. like just so you know like playing some skittles like there's like a skittles room it's like i don't even know where that term came from because someone was tasting the rainbow that night i don't know and and they named it skittle i don't know right but the skittles taste the rainbow chess i literally don't know where skittles came from in chess i've been asked that but the skittles room is a real thing and it just means like full around chess and then blitz that he says at the end is speed chess like blitz is speed chess so that that was kind of like one of those things where they fed him some lines you know that I don't know that Bruce Pandolfini or Gary Kasparov were on set that day advising. I'll say that, right? <laughs> it, um, is 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 bullet a thing? Is bullet blitz speed? Are those a thing? Or is bullet not a thing? I just have no, it written bu- down. Bullet is a thing, but he but he doesn't oh. say that. He actually says speed chess, and then he says blitz in the end. He doesn't actually say bullet. Um, so you're right. If he had said bullet, that would have checked out because that would be a different kind of chess. So anyway, I'm nitpicking. This is where the, you know, the Purdue Hollywood producer gets mad at the chess player where he just says, you know, look, thank, you know, be grateful. You got any attention chess guy. Um, so he's not wrong, but I, I did want to point out that for like the, for the chess people, there was a little bit of a, of a Michael Scott cringe where you go, Ooh, that's, that's a little awkward, right? It made you feel that way. Um, but long story short, they sit down and here they go. Now you take it away. They're playing some speed. They're playing some speed chess and apparently different than bullet, which I had written down. I don't know why I did. I mean, bullets are fast and it's kind of like your blitz in. Well, to explain this to me, but this is a fantastic just setup because I don't think that Beth has played speed chess at all before. I think she says that and she has no idea what she's in for to be honest, because she's just only really played one type of chess. And if you go back to even the Kentucky um, state championship where she had to learn about time control, this is a whole nother beast. And Benny throws up the $5 per game and she is in for a world of hurt. So I need to understand and the, the listeners need to really understand is why was it in which Beth simply got crushed so hard in this speed chess? And why is it so different than normal chess? So, um, a few a few things right the um 
the first thing is later on they kind of break down the dialogue you know on the rest day where where he kind of he kind of acknowledges that you know he knew he was going to be better than her at speech yes right because she hasn't played a lot of blitz yep. and um so i think part of it is that she just is sort of out of her league trying to hustle with the hustler kind of thing right whereas you know when you're playing with a guy who like clearly, you know, we end up finding out later he lives in New York. Like I said, Benny is the exemplary, exemplary depiction of a chess guy who spent a lot of time just playing a lot of chess. And I think that she was just kind of out of her league against a hustler on a night with some beers and some bros and some blitz. Beers, bros, and blitz. By the way, that's a great bar name. Beers, bros, and blitz. Okay, noted. Um, So... So I think that was partly that. And then also what we find out later on in the episode is sort of the twist ending that she was kind of playing him a little bit, I think, because she was like, he was like, hey, you know, she's like, hey, were you trying to intimidate me? He's like, I don't need to intimidate you to beat you. But then we find out that she basically crushes him in the last game and went to win the championship. Right. And and I think there was a part of her that was sort of figuring him out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um at least that's sort of the way that they they kind of set that up is that she basically was getting inside his head more than he realized and she was making mental notes of like his strengths and weaknesses and i'm saying all this knowing that the greatest blitz and speech chess of this entire series is coming up in the next episode okay that's the only teaser i'll give but it does it does matter and it gives me a little bit of context here. And I, I think that one, yes, she was for the first time out of her league a little bit, but I also think she wasn't as bad as she was letting on, and that Beth Beth was playing chess while Benny was playing checkers, yo. Like that was a little bit of what was going on. I now that you articulate it that way, I can sort of see the reverse of it because when I was watching it back, I didn't correlate the events of the Blitz to the super fast finish that she had, which was under 30 moves because they're at the bar drinking over it. And Benny gets crushed in under 30 moves, which is very fast as we saw other ones go longer, much longer. And I can sort of see it now where while it sort of upped his ego, right? I think it maybe boosted his ego so much the night before that maybe he lost sight and started to play some of what he was going into as a blitz mentality and threw him for a loop. I could definitely see that. And and nothing he said was untrue, by the way, speed chess is different than classical chess. Like it's, it's just a different, it's a different game. I mean, just purely you have much, much, much less time. So you're relying on, on different types of tactics, some people who, who have specific opening repertoires and, and reach similar types of structures can be more effective at blitz than they would be at classical chess. And the reason for that is like, um, what's the best way to say it? Like, imagine, like if you're being faced with the same type of problem over and over again, and you've seen it more than your opponent, you will seem better than you actually are overall at, at like the puzzle. Right. Does that make sense? Right. Mm-hmm. It'd be like, mm-hmm. I wish, I wish I could make an analogy. I sound like an idiot, but if you were like speed writing code, do coders do speed runs by the way, <laughs> right? Do we do speed? It'd be like, or be like if someone's doing a speed run of Mario and they're the best in the world at, at at levels one, two, and three, and the game only lasts long enough that we're consistently racing through levels one, two, and three, we never actually see the entire show, right? Does that make sense, right? So speed chess can basically, ex, you know, make people stronger than they actually are because like you know, you don't have enough time to solve or create more problems for an opponent who's consistently kind of playing their same opening repertoire, which means they're more familiar with the type of middle game pawn structures they get, which means they're more familiar with the type of tactics that ensue. And so the whole thing becomes self-fulfilling where there are people that are better at speed and blitz and bullet than they actually are at classical chess, where their opponent has a little more time on the clock to like, to remember and, and to patiently expose other problems and things like that. So while overall the best players in the world are also the best in the world at every time control, including Blitz and Bullet, there are some type of people that because of their style are just better at faster time controls than they are at classical time controls. Gotcha. Yeah. And like you said, they're very, very, very different games. Yep. There you go. So, but then, you know, as we continue, right. So then what happens, like, you know, as we said, like the next day she kind of is like playing the poor girl on the bench, like, Hey, did you do that to intimidate me? But then she destroys his face. And the next thing we see is them commiserating over it in a bar where we find out we don't even ever see anything 
there are no X's and O's of this game. All we know is that yeah. Beth, you know, kicked his ass basically. And we see like an E4 opening, I think, from Benny, who who opens as white, by the way. Uh, and yeah, that's it. And and that's and that's, that's it. kind and of the she... that's kind of the episode, to be honest yep. with you. I, yeah, done. But so what I was going to say, so now that you've heard my version of that, are you buying that? That they kind of set it up where like Beth was actually playing chess while Benny was playing checkers. She was kind of getting to know him and he kind of feels played in the end that she sort of basically, you know, she white man can't jumped him. You know, I, she bigger. I it, she she hustled the hustler in the end. I think it comes back to almost maybe we'll do a little call out to little Harry Beltic here, right? Who was yeah. like, you got to study. You got to study Borgov. You got to study, you know, Benny. And right. I mean, hey, what can you say? Harry Beltic saves the day. Yeah. And she and she did it and she won. And then and then we get those those final conversations in the bar, right? Before we wrap up the episode breakdown. This is where we set the tone where he's like, All right, so you've beaten me, you know, you're preparing for Paris, but what are you gonna do about Russia? Right. He, you know, he's like, Hey, did you not get the memo in Kentucky? Right. Now you get to go to Russia because you won the US championship, which is, by the way, like that's that's not a very concrete affiliation. It is it is a concrete thing that the US would want to send their best players to represent them in those events, right? But it's it's I've never known of like an event that is literally directly associated with the US championship kind of qualifier. I'm sure there is, and I'm just, you know, I'm just mis misremembering. But um anyway, what were your thoughts there on the final dialogue before we set the tone for the next episode? Yeah, no, I loved, I loved the dialogue. I love the com- camaraderie between them. You know, she's like, I can't believe you're taking this so well. And he's like, I'm boiled over and anger inside right. and he's playing the right. cool. And you start to see a weird uh, friendship start to form uh, there and they're now one, one, you know, right. so that's, that's not bad. And I, and I think it's, it's fun. She sees this hope that she now has this big, she's going to be sent over to Russia. Right. So I think that's really, really fun. It's a really good episode. I really enjoyed this episode. I had less notes and usually have like 25 pages of notes. And I said, you know, there's really just some interesting things with Harry, some interesting things from the U S championship. And we're not going to pull out any weird, crazy. That's a Boeing 784, you know, that didn't exist Danny. but, uh, uh, yeah, it was a good episode. I, I enjoyed well, and it. Then, I, and then in the bar though, I mean, there's the, like where she kind of rubs Benny's hair. Right. And he's like, wait a second, mm. not happening. Remember what he yeah. says to her? No oh. sex. <laughs> No sex. No sex. <laughs> he he let he laid down the ground rules. He's like, this right. is this is what's gonna happen. You can come to New York, but no sex. So that's so. what he does. So he invites her to New York, which is again like I thought was was kind of like other than the you know the guy girl sexual tension thing. Like that's kind of a thing a lot of chess players did in the era. Like they would you know that was their best chance to travel and work together. And the Soviets were famous for working more closely as a team because everything was about Soviet glory, not about individual glory. Right? The being being a state sponsored mindset is very different than like what America's mindset has always been. And that really is something I've experienced in, in terms of the capitalistic versus like for the greater good nature. And you and I could get in, I mean, this is a whole other podcast, but there are things Harry Beltic says earlier where he says that who's the guy he says that what's his name must have been super tired or someone poisoned his tea. Oh, yeah. it. You remember that? Mm-hmm. So that was yeah. actually a direct reference to Man, yeah, we did skip over something. That that was really good because it's direct reference to accusations that have come toward or came toward the Soviet Union on a regular basis in the era in terms of coercing um, and manipulating results to ensure that the person they wanted to win would win. Like players would be told, like, hey, Botvinnik is supposed to win this tournament or Carries is supposed to win this tournament. And um, because that was who the Soviets had decided already was their best chance at retaining the world title or winning the world title. And so some of those things were like borderline sort of proven with corroboration and evidence. Some of them were pure rumors, but it definitely was something that Bobby Fischer was very outspoken and accusatory of the, of the Soviets doing Um, sort of, you know, this whole, this whole greater, you know, game theory thing. And so for Benny, I digress a little bit, but I'm getting to the point that for Benny to kind of invite Beth is kind of like the beginning of the U.S. being like, hey, she's our best hope. Like, you're going to go over there. I'm going to give you all that I have to give you, right? And make sure that you're prepared because the Americans historically have not worked as well together as the Russians, as the Soviets, and it always showed in the biggest moments. And so 
that was my final note in the end, um, as far as things about him inviting her to New York, in addition to whatever the S-E-X-U-L, I'll call it the chess you tension that's developing about Beth and, and Benny's hair. <laughs> there you go. And it is good hair. Um, can Why is this episode called Fork? I, I, I don't actually understand. So my personal opinion is because Beth kind of hits a fork in the road, and I guess she goes the direction of, uh, she goes away from, Harry Beltic in the direction of, of choosing, choosing, you know, the chess, I guess. I don't know. I mean, double attack in that, you know, she's got both Harry and Benny that she's into. I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm drawing here, right? Um, fork, uh, come on, throw something at me. <laughs> uh, holy fork balls. Um, no, but I, I kind of took it as like a little bit of a fork in the road, mm. um, for, for Beth and she goes the route of, Benny and hops in a car and heads to New York with him. Um, you know, I, I guess so. I guess so. You know, honestly, gosh, fork, fork. I don't know. I, I couldn't, there was, cause there wasn't any chess. Often we can relate it to chess and to the show itself. Yeah. Maybe there was a, a fork in the road of, she wasn't choosing between anything. That's the thing is that, that's why I couldn't figure it out. So I did, I couldn't relate the title to this to really, yeah. And so if any of our listeners know, definitely let us know. You can yeah, write please. into the show at blunders.fm or you can leave comments on the YouTube videos, which we have some, Danny. We have some uh, comments. Uh, I, I literally, right as you said that, I was pulling it up. Go ahead. So um, you can read one first and I'll choose one. Yeah, so I have one. This is on the last episode, Middle Game, from Julian Drews. This is longer. I'll only read the first half of it. And um, Julian here was talking specifically around the tapping of the foot during chess. He says, as he says, great episode, best podcast in the entire world. Thank you, Julian. Uh, I said, however, as a European, I beg to differ on the question of tapping your foot loudly during a chess game. It's considered not only to be unethical, but also the general attitude towards something like that here in the, in the European chess scene. From what I've gathered over the years, of course, there's exceptions, is you're not good enough to let your moves do the talking. So you have to resort to distracting your opponent. Sign of a weak player, in my opinion. That's the main reason why he can't, they, Julian, can't uh, stand Kasparov. Calling an arbiter in this situation would not be a sign of a weakness, but a sign of not putting up with unfair BS in their honest opinion, Danny. I, I don't know that he's wrong, and I don't I don't remember actually dis disagreeing with him. I kind of said it was sort of an unethical thing to do. It was... What I, I think what I was partly drawing to is that they were both very young, impatient players, right? Her opponent was young, like a kid, literally. And she's kind of like sort of unethically kind of tapping her foot, right? And I actually talked a lot about, you know, some players that have been known to do things like that. And I wasn't I wasn't applauding or encouraging the behavior. I'm just saying it is a thing. And it's kind of a mental warfare thing that it has been done. And I don't think it's okay. And I don't I don't even think in the US it's okay. Mark my words, if an arbiter was called they would punish them. But I don't know that someone would immediately call the arbiter versus just trying to ignore them and kind of like sort of man up and, and ignore versus versus like just call it out and say, hey, that's unfair. And you're right. I mean, there are different cultural standards and different thoughts about that stuff. I don't I don't disagree with with Julian at all. I just think there's, um, you know, depending on where you come from, there's different expectations about how to handle your opponent's behavior. You know, I was like, I was I was both taught like very very clear like ethical like standards and I was even like chastised very heavily. Some people get up and go look at the board from their opponent's side, like to, like stand directly behind their opponent's board as if that makes a difference. Which believe me, it doesn't really, but they do it to convince themselves it does. But they're secretly doing it to annoy their opponent. And I know that a lot of people have done that. And I actually was chastised really heavily by by Igor Ivanov, my coach, because that was a super unethical thing to do. And he was like, you can't do that. That's that's not right. So I, I don't know that it is such a, I don't think it's a European versus American versus Soviet Union thing. I think it's an individual person thing. And I think that people hopefully were given like the right like standards to let their moves do the talking and not try to distract their opponent. But also there are many stories of both amateurs and among the world's best. I mentioned some names who were known to do things and even accused of doing things whether it's an accidental jerk under the table or staring someone down. And at the same time, like there were times where people won games and felt like they were an intimidating presence. And, 
you know, to them, all was fair in love and war because the goal is to win and they're a competitor first. So, you know, I think there's a lot of different way people like interpret things like that. But if I came across as condoning the foot tapping, that was not what I was saying at all. I was just clarifying that there's a lot of different things that happen in tournaments that I think people like James who don't know the chess environment would be like, hey, would anybody ever do that? And I'd be like, you know what? Yeah, actually, there's a lot of things people do in tournaments and in environments that are ethical or not on the scale of one to 10, right? Like it, everyone's scale is a little different. And um, I will say this, if my opponent was tapping and it was a tile floor and it was that loud, I would have called the arbiter for sure. Right. Um, if it was like a carpet floor, I, maybe I would, I don't know. It just depends, <laughs> I guess, you know, um, oh, man. Oh, you know, that's good. but yeah, I, I don't know if I properly answered the question. I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think it does depend on the kind of person and he, you give kind of a long explanation of different, you know, Soviet union versus European. And I don't really know that it's fair to say that it's, it's the culture. I think it is just the type of person and people, mm. you know, sometimes you learn things that you also then as you're later older, you learn that, Oh, that wasn't the right thing to do. Even if I was taught it and you as a person choose to do something differently. Right. But I was kind of making the point that these things do happen. You would be surprised by the amount of psychological and mental warfare that goes on and how people handle it and what the standards are can vary, very differently. Can, can vary V A R Y V E R Y differently. All right. Enough said. Got it. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, last thing I'll say is Alvaro Gonzalez says, I know that chess.com commenters use the YouTube chess.com interface. I wanted to say, I agree with you. He wishes I could show the annotations when I'm describing the chess moves, but unfortunately, Alvaro, um, this is just a podcast. So, um, we don't have, we're not doing that. Um, if I ever do like a full video breakdown, we will definitely show it, but you can slowly follow along with the links that we give for the analysis. I apologize. We can't add that visual element here, man. My apologies. Sorry, James, you go ahead. Yeah, no, we try to add links on blunders.fm and we do, we do post these to Danny's YouTube. So if you are listening on YouTube, we appreciate you being here and we do read all the comments there too. We also encourage you to subscribe on your favorite podcast app, uh, app that's out there. Google, Google podcast, Apple podcast, Spotify, we're on all of them. That way you, you know, get up to date, but you can also just follow Danny's. We're just posting them there as a, yet another way to get the podcast out to the people. And we got some good comments. In fact, one here from Andrew three days ago, this was on openings, which, um, you know, we've been seeing some activity on the first one. So people are still catching up, right? We have to go back. Um, Andrew says our chessboard is wrongly aligned in our, in our, uh, logo. Really? Is that, is that correct? I'm wait a second. Hold a tick. Hold on. I'm sorry. My, my internet I'm recording on with Mots today is uh, from uh, from home, which is slightly slower. Don't worry, this isn't going to make it into the final edited edition. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I love saying things. Don't worry, this won't make it into the final edited edition, knowing that it will, because it's oh, yeah. funnier. Um, all right. Uh, sorry, I'm opening it now. Allows me to look. Um, honestly, we have not paid very close attention to the thumbnail, but that is a very important piece of evidence, especially for a podcast that's all about chess or has a chess master who notices things when they're wrong. And I think indeed he's right, but hold on. I'm trying to make a very close look to see whatever excuses I can make. It's kind of hard because the chess pieces are slow. close. Is, is he saying that the, like our queen and King should be on opposite sides? No, he's saying, he's saying the closest square is, is, is what he's right. Oh my gosh, I have to redo this image and update the artwork. So the square where the white rook should be, the closest square to us should be a light square. Uh, if you raise your right hand when you're facing a chessboard, the square in the, in the far right corner should be white for both players. So oh. um, like if black and white are facing across, the colors are actually wrong here. Now, the board is not wrong necessarily if it was set up the other way. Like if black was facing white, like directly in front of us, does that make sense? Or yeah, white yeah, was facing sense. black, but from the sideways angle, that's actually incorrect. Oh my God. I feel deeply ashamed. And for the record, I just, I was not focused on that element of this particular image, but we will address that. I'm literally taking a screenshot of it for Marina, my lovely designer who made this image for me and Mott's quite some time ago. I do have to say that someone did comment, Mick Allen, who said that it actually could be on purpose. Our podcast is called coffee house blunders. Well, either that, or I should just leave it that way and forever let this comment to Andrew live in infamy. 
Um, I think so. I think we have to. Maybe we'll just maybe. let it be. Wow, copy house <laughs> wonders. There you go. So guess what? It was planned all along, Andrew. Twist ending, you just got punked. <laughs> but we just got served, son. Um, anyways, <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. because No, it does make sense because I'm looking at your, your, your Chess Bullet Brawls live show recap, and I do see that. Yeah, now I understand. Funnily, I do like that analogy that we all learned something today. Lift your right hand up, and that should be the white square on the, on the yep. right side. Crazy. Yep. Anyways. All right, yeah. buddy. <laughs> crazy, crazy stuff. So, all right. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. I cannot wait for six and seven. We'll be back next week. We hope everyone has a happy holiday, um, whether you're celebrating Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, all the holidays. We hope you um, warm wishes, and uh, we will see you right before the New Year's, and then after the New Year's for episode six and seven. Make sure that you tell your friends about the podcast. If you've enjoyed this, go to blunders.fm. You can leave a comment anywhere or send us an email. So until next week, this has been Coffeehouse Blunders. Thanks for listening.